As a man named Andrew, this gospel story here from Matthew is one of, one of the stories I feel like I've always known. Like I know that can't literally be true, but, but I cannot remember a time not knowing this story. Jesus calling Andrew and Peter, both fishermen, to become instead fishers of men, as the old translations put it. This story is famous enough to be in all the children's Bibles. It's in every Sunday school curriculum I think that's ever been written. And one of the main characters in it shares, you know, my name, shares our name as the people of St. Andrews. Um, by the way, in case you're new here, uh, I didn't name this place. <laughs> okay? That's not how I roll. Uh, the bishop, 17 years ago now, Bishop Stanton, he named this church. Um, and he named it because Father Mike, the founding priest of St. Andrews, asked him to name it uh, St. Andrews. Because in the Bible, Peter and Andrew are brothers, and the other big Episcopal church in McKinney is St. Peter's. So even as they are brothers in the Bible, we are sibling churches to our community here um, in McKinney and Allen and Frisco and this area. So it wasn't me. I was not a thought on anyone's mind when this church was named. I've always felt a connection to St. Andrew, of course, like saints in the Bible, but, but answering the phone like St. Andrew's, this is Andrew, that was not <laughs> the thing we were going for. At any rate, like just as this story feels special to me as an Andrew, the story about St. Andrew, it, um, it feels special to us as a church. This is our, one of the stories of St. Andrew. Um, but I, at least, for a long time, um, found this story rather terrifying. Because Jesus, like, let's say, he's walking by the Sea of Galilee. He's just walking, right? Walking by the Sea of Galilee. He's on the edge of the shore. And seemingly out of nowhere, he says, follow me. And Andrew and Peter just drop everything and follow him. And I just know myself well enough to know, like, again, that's not how I roll. I'd be like, go away, crazy person. I'm not coming back to shore as long as you're still there, right? Like, this is very weird. Like, and I've always, well, what I was thought, particularly young, like, how is this normative? Like, my parents told me not to go away with strangers, right? Like, how is this an acceptable action? Is it supposed to model the appropriate response? At least as I see it, and look, I'm the one preaching this morning, so you're stuck with that. Um, at least as I see it, there are three things about Jesus' call in Andrew and Peter and James and John's response that seem hard about this. One is the immediacy of it. The immediacy, immediacy of it, right? Jesus walks by and says, now, and they say, okay. Right? Just immediately they left their nets. The second thing that seems hard is they're already busy. These first disciples were not like playing Wordle. You know, they were busy with lots to do. They were working hard. And the third thing is that they're leaving a lot of their security behind. As Matthew tells us in verse 22, they left the boat and their father, left their nets. Now, in, in point of fact, I think the story we read last week, those of you who were in church last week, we read this story from John's Gospel. And in that story, Andrew and Peter and presumably others, they get to know Jesus down when Jesus goes to get baptized by John in the River Jordan. And they spend some time with Jesus there. Surely they talked, and they learned, and they planned. Jesus probably did not show up on the seashore as a stranger. But as our story opens, John has been arrested, and so Jesus withdraws into Galilee. He goes north into Galilee. Presumably, Andrew and Peter did the same thing. They went home. To Galilee, too. Everyone sort of regroups. They get ready. And then Jesus shows up this afternoon and says, All right, it's time. Let's go. Follow me. I believe that broader story, the way the Gospels together tell it, makes better sense of what happened. And yet Matthew tells the story this particular way, focusing on just this part. It's as though rather than trying to 
get all the historical details of the whole thing down on paper. Scripture is trying to impress upon us something about how immediately they responded, how busy they were, and how much they had to leave the safety of their family and the known. The point, I think, of Scripture is not to get every historical detail down, but to get the ones that tell us something about the nature of Jesus' call, that it's right now, even though we're busy, and above all else. Right now, even though we're busy, and above all else. Let's look at these three hard things in order. First, the immediacy of it. Peter and Andrew are called first. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. Immediately. Same thing with John, James and John, verse 22. Immediately. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, many of us um, are not like this. <laughs> We're more like uh, St. Saint, Saint Augustine. St. Saint Augustine famously prayed, Lord, give me chastity and continence, but not yet. <laughs> I, I guess it worked out for Augustine in the end, but, but there's a reason the right time to respond to Jesus is right now. I was reading a, a story recently of a um, film and video class at a, at a university in Florida. And at the beginning of the semester, the professor called, or divided the whole class into two groups. And to the first group, he said, um, hey, Siri, the first group, he said, uh, you are going to be graded solely on quantity by the number of photos you turn in this semester. You turn in 100, you get an A. 90, you get a B. 80, you get a C. And so on and so forth. To the other group, he said, you are going to be graded solely on the quality. All semester, you just need to turn in one photo, your very best photo, and it will grade the quality of that one photo. And at the end of the semester, all of the best photographs in the class were taken by the group that was graded on quantity. Because they were the ones who had been taking pictures, who had been practicing, who had been getting better, who had been figuring things out, the group that was trying to think and plan and wait for the perfect opportunity to take the perfect photo, they never got there. Something is analogously true in our spiritual lives. The best thing is just to start, to practice, to get better, to figure it out. Peter, James, and John, and to a lesser extent, Andrew, but him too, they were the head apostles. They were like the captains. You know, the guys with the little stars on their jerseys among the, the apostles. Not coincidentally, they were the ones who started first. They were the first one. They had the longest to practice. As Paul writes in 2 Corinthians, he says, look, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait, thinking that in the future there'll be a better opportunity. Like, you'll get the holiness stuff figured out later. It will not be more advantageous later. Just follow the processional cross Will's going to carry right on out the door today and try and love where Jesus would love. Get started immediately. We'll keep going immediately, as the case may be for you. So right now, the first part. Of course, part of the problem with doing it right now is that we're busy. We're busy doing very many things. So, so were these four fishermen. Like, if you think you have a work-life balance or a school-life balance problem, like, try being a first-century fisherman in a subsistence economy. Or maybe it's not work that keeps you stretched thin. Maybe it's caring for aging parents or caring for your grandkids or your own doctor's appointments you've got to get to regularly. Earlier this week, uh, you may have read the world's oldest living human being died. Her name was Sister Andre, and she was a nun. She died at the St. Catherine Labor Nursing Home in Toulon, France. 
he was just a few weeks shy of turning, get this, turning 119 years old. She lived through both world wars, right? like remembers them both. Now, less than a year ago, after her 118th birthday, she was asked about her secrets. And the nun said, working. She said, working makes you live. And she went on to explain, I worked till I was 108 years old. Sister Andre was, I kid you not, doing housekeeping at the nursing home in which she lived until she was 108 years old. Now, this does not mean that professional employment is like the be-all, end-all of life. Work takes many forms, only some of them are jobs. But it's totally natural that Jesus called those who were working hard to be his disciples. To the good nun's point, work is harmonious with God's will. Remember, it's a God who worked on day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six before resting on day seven. It's the God who ordained Adam and Eve after he made them to tend, to work the Garden of Eden. Jesus does not call anywhere in the scriptures called idle loafers. Sloth is one of the seven deadly sins. Now, obviously, Jesus does not call everyone away from their day job the way he did Peter and Andrew and James and John. St. Paul kept his day job. But a willingness to work is an appealing quality to Jesus. Your busyness, it need not be seen as an obstacle to discipleship. It's a qualification. So, Jesus' call to discipleship is right now, even though we're busy. That's two of the three hard things. The third is what you leave behind. Now, the disciples in this story, they leave behind their nets, their boats, and most touchingly, their father. Most touchingly, most terrifyingly, I, I don't know. Both. Or, you know, maybe Zebedee, maybe he wasn't so bummed. Uh, I know a lot of parents out there right now be like, look, I got a millennial living in my house, Jesus. If you would show up and call it out, that would be great, right? But, uh, but th- there's no sugarcoating this thing about families in the gospel. Like, namely, that Jesus considers earthly families less important than being a part of the family of God. Blood may be thicker than water, but Jesus shed both blood and water out of his side. Kind of trumps it all. But I don't, well, that's true. Like, that is in the gospel. I don't think that's really what's going on here. The nets are like the tools of their trade. The boat, the boat is the thing that kept them safe on the waters, safe from the dangers they faced on it. Their father is the patriarch under whose wisdom and leadership they found protection. The things they they have to leave behind are the things they depend on to make their own way in the world. They're all fine, the nets, the boat, the father. Those are all fine. But the very safety they provide serves to confine and, and shelter the men whom Jesus is calling. You know, for computers and technology to change the world, like the computer geeks, they had to move out of the basement and out of their parents' garage. The same thing is true of the disciples. Like, Peter had to leave the boat to become the rock on which the church is built. James and John had to leave their father before they wrote the scriptures that we still read today. Andrew had to put down the nets before he became the sort of person whom people in suburban North Texas 2,000 years later gather under a shelter that is named after him. I, I don't know, I can't say standing here what those things are for you. I can look back at my own life and I can see some of them. Like I had to give up a really good LSAT score. I had to give up a job at Amazon. And I'm sure there's more to come for me. But, but then again, I'm weird. I became a priest, right? I know that's not normative for all of us. Um, I, I can't say specifically what these things are for you. But if you just remember that God's call is above all else, you'll figure it out. 
And it's not easy, but remember, God's plans are far bigger, far bigger than the small, safe, comfortable spot we can vainly protect on our own. His plans for Andrew and Peter and James and John were far bigger than their biggest nets, the largest boat. Jesus calls us above all else. For all the things we might hold on to, they limit what we can dream, imagine, and do. Above all else means that the God of unlimited power, unlimited grace, is free to move in our lives beyond the shackles of the limits we set for ourselves. This passage, um, I still find it hard and bracing, but it's not terrifying. The sparse details of the narrative, the way Matthew presents it, it's just like, follow me immediately. They left. I think it's all there to help us see the model of Jesus' call and our response. Above all else, Jesus calls us right now, even though we're busy. So let's not tell him, go away, crazy man. Immediately, let's follow. Let's do the best we can right now, even while we're busy and above all else. And then we'll come back here next week and we'll drink up the grace and go do it again. Amen.